nobody uh, you know, accused me of burying both him and Dub, you know, as it were, to have placing one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. But you know, that's just not the case. You know, if that were the case, I've done a very poor job of it. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I was just uh, being a mathematician, a uh, uh, accountant. You know, I can I can count numbers, and and that was merely the application that I was making. And I don't know, you know, what constitute old. I know what constitute years, but I don't really know what constitutes old. And I'm not saying that Dub is old by any means. Of course, uh, when he goes to the restaurant, they always have him prepay. <laughs> you know, just just in case. <laughs> uh, really, I think the years have treated him very kindly. But you know, the guy can eat anything he wants and never gains an ounce. He told me that the only thing that uh, uh, has affected him age-wise is that his memory is not as good as it used to be. Also, he told me that his memory is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> I hope his memory hasn't failed him <laughs> this, this occasion. The only thing uh, has changed in his bio since uh, the last time I didn't read his bio <laughs> is, that he, is that he has spoken one time on the 2012 spring CFTF lectureship. <coughs> He's going to speak tonight, assuming his memory holds has the new testament church been restored you know he spoke before on the uh, principle of restoration is it a scriptural principle so this is the counterpart to that has the new testament church been restored dub come speak to us It's always a high point of uh, my year to get to come to spring, and uh, I think there's two years in a row the Bonds have been able to come with me, which is some sort of a record, and uh, certainly glad that she was able to this year as well. We uh, stay in pretty close touch with uh, uh, Ken, anyway, and with David. Uh, in the very nature of the case, David and I visit a good bit about various subjects, and uh, the elders here oversee our support funds, and uh, Ken is the bursar of those funds and sends them to me, I assume, as regularly as he receives them. <laughs> At least I hope he does. <laughs> But it's a, a very fine working relationship for us. We appreciate uh, these men who are elders here so very much. And I appreciate David and, and Jody and so sorry that uh, they got knocked out today by illness and are not able to be here. I know how much David means to this congregation, David and Jody both, and uh, how much they mean to many of the others of us as well. I want to mention the books just a little bit of the lectureship. Um, we uh, buy one of these books for every family in the congregation with which I work. And we give them to them instead of selling them to them. <laughs> now I know that not all of you can do that. Uh, we don't have that many families, but uh, we still think this is very important material to get into their hands. And I believe that they really appreciate uh, these books and they read these books. They love the truth and we want to keep them loving the truth and knowing what the truth is as well as knowing what error is in contrast. So you brethren are doing yeoman's uh, work in producing these books uh, just the last two or three years. If we had no more books than these that you produced they uh, would stand as uh, gold mines of great uh, treasures of truth for many years to come, incidentally. Now, uh, 
I'm sorry that Brother Terry Hightower had to go home. I, I told Terry before he left that I had his back, that I felt sorry for him, that people were picking on him far too much, and that I was going to take up for him. And uh, when I think of Terry, <clears throat> I think of a story I heard many years ago of a little boy was uh, walking down the street and a wagon came by with a load of molasses and a barrel fell off and molasses went everywhere. And, and he uh, prayed, Lord, give me a, a tongue equal to this occasion. <laughs> but when I think of Terry, he prays, give me an occasion equal to this tongue. <laughs> and. Uh, I don't know that that prayer has ever been answered yet. <laughs> don't know that it can be. <laughs> well, I want to take up for him a little bit. And uh, truth be told, he deserves anything that we can dish out because he is the biggest disher of all. <laughs> we do have a lot of fun as well as studying the Word of God together at lectureships. And uh, I think it's good, wholesome fun. and. Uh, uh, something we look forward to each year. I will not say anything new to you tonight. In fact, uh, some of the things I will say will be repetition of what we've heard already during the week. So if uh, you're expecting to hear something revolutionary or uh, uh, very new that uh, you have not heard before, you're going to be disappointed. But I believe the things we uh, will look at this hour will be things that need to be reinforced and that we dare not ever forget. When we start forgetting the things that uh, we'll be talking about at this hour and have been throughout the week, then we will have started to lose our scriptural bearings and our scriptural reason for existence. Has the New Testament church been restored? If you ask some who still claim to be members of the church of the Lord that question, you'll be met with derision and laughter, bo laughter born of mockery because they do not believe that it needs to be restored even if it's possible to restore it. And so obviously they don't believe that it has been restored. They believe that those who say that it can be and has been restored are living in a land of illusion, that it's only an illusion that it's been restored and that it cannot really be restored. But in answering this question, there are two correct answers. One of them is yes. Has the New Testament church been restored? The other is no. It has not been restored. Unless you think that I've completely lost my mind, let's see why that is so. If one is considering the personal holiness of each member of the church of the Lord, when he asks this question, has the New Testament church been restored in every personal life? The answer is no, and it never will be. Not fully, perfectly restored not a one of us will ever live perfectly the Christian life. Personal spiritual restoration is a perpetual process. Now, unfortunately, the liberals who make fun of the restoration principle believe that the restoration of the church as God gave it to us in its outward appearances and marks and identifiers is just something that we must always be working for and never can find the completion of. But that is true of our personal restoration, our personal uh, replicating of the abilities, the characteristics, the traits of our Lord. 2 Peter 1 verses 5 through 8 give us a fair summary of the way that the Lord intends for us to live. We call this the Christian graces. I'll not take time to read or quote these. 
But these summarize the way that the Lord intends for his people in his church to live. Now, LaVon can tell you that I still have work to do in all of these areas. Is there a husband or a wife anywhere that has reached perfection in the personal traits of Jesus? Is there a perfect or flawless preacher of the gospel who has ever lived besides our Lord? Is there any eldership anywhere that uh, does not have room to grow and mature in spiritual matters and in wisdom? Well, of course, the answer to all of these questions is uh, no, there is not. If Paul, the great spiritual giant of his time, had to say, I do not yet consider myself to have attained... I don't have it made yet, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, then I cannot say that I've reached a plateau beyond which I cannot grow. If this same Paul could say, I buffet my body and bring it into subjection, lest that while I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway, as he said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, then I have to keep working at the job to personally restore in my life the traits of character that we see in the Lord. But the remonstrance of those who ridicule the claim of uh, restoration often cite the personal characteristics of members of the Lord's body when you ask, has the church been restored? And so they say, no, it has not, based upon these personal characteristics and their deficiencies in various members. Rubel Shelley, in a speech in 1990 to the Richland Hills Church, Richland Hills, Texas, is now called The Hills because they now have a satellite congregation that's way off in West Fort Worth, and it's not in Richland Hills anymore, so they had to get a more generic name. And I hope the next stage in that evolution will be they just drop Church of Christ, but he said this in that speech, which church do you want to restore? Jerusalem with its lack of evangelistic zeal, or restore Corinth with its open fornication and drunkenness in church services around communion time? What about Colossae with its heresy? What about Ephesus? What about Laodicea, that church that says we've got it? And he said, you're dead as a hammer and don't know it. They said, we don't need anything. He said, you need everything. And so you see the attitude of the liberal toward restoring the church. They think only about personal characteristics of the members. The emphasis here in this quotation is on such things as apathy, immorality, susceptibility to heresy of certain individuals, smug with uh, lukewarmness. These uh, personal spiritual failings and flaws in human beings that were in New Testament congregations during apostolic days and that will be in every congregation, personally speaking, until the Lord returns. All of these have to do with the human side of the church and not the divine. I remind us that no individual human being besides the Lord has attained moral and our spiritual perfection and none ever shall. For all have sinned, that's an aorist tense verb, speaking of everyone who has ever lived up to the time that Paul wrote these words. All have sinned and fall or come, that's a present tense form, meaning all at this present time and all who will continue to live short of the grace or glory of God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. So none will ever attain that spiritual perfection. Almost 20 years ago, I wrote the following words in addressing some of these Shelley contentions, <clears throat> and they still reflect my conviction, so I didn't see a need in rewriting them. I know of no one who would deny that the human element of the church has always been and ever will be imperfect. It is not possible even for the most dedicated 
believer to live above sin absolutely. One who claims to do so is a liar, 1 John 1, verse 8. Members of the church of God will always be fallible creatures ever in need of pressing on toward the goal and the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. However, when we consider the divine element of the church, the way the Lord ordained it, planned it, and built it, that is another matter altogether. The divine element relates to the way the church is to be organized, the way it is to worship, the way men may enter it, and what its work and nature are. In other words, outward visible elements of the church. To point to the failures in the personal lives of Christians as evidence that the church has not been restored is beyond absurd. One may as well deny that a restored automobile is actually restored because some of its passengers are drunk. Let's now turn the attention to the question of restoration that pertains to the framework and the design and the pattern the New Testament sets forth for the church, the divine element of the church. The answer to that question, of course, is yes. The church can be, must be, restored and has been restored. Now let's set forth the case. Is restoration possible or necessary? Let us first inquire. There are those who deny both of these. They think it's neither necessary nor possible. And of course, if they are correct, we need go no further. It cannot be restored if it's not possible to restore it. Even I can figure that out. But to deny the principle, plea, and possibility of the actuality of restoring the church requires a broadside against scripture-based and time-honored biblical hermeneutics, or principles of biblical interpretation. And it's no wonder then that the anti-restoration party inveighs against what they call pattern theology, because that is all wrapped up in correct biblical hermeneutics. They view what they style as the old hermeneutic of interpreting and applying scripture by observing its direct statements, by looking at its accounts of action and uh, the implications that can be found with various passages and statements. All of that is repugnant unto them. They have nothing but ridicule for the inspired concept of prohibitions that are based upon scriptural silence as well as upon scriptural statements. And while decrying what they call proof text hermeneutics and uh, concordance sermons, it is noteworthy that they nonetheless eagerly and hypocritically quickly run to any passage which they think might in some way establish their false case. Let's now briefly address the dual-pronged assertion that restoration is both unnecessary and impossible. Several avenues of proof falsify that assertion. First, note that God has made his will known through patterns which he expects men to follow. And when these are followed, they produce replicas of the original. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 5 and 6 makes it abundantly clear that God has a pattern for the church even as he had a pattern for the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Verse 5 deals with the Old Testament pattern, the tabernacle pattern. And God said to Moses, you make all things according to the pattern. Immediately then in verse 6, the inspired writer applies that to Christ and his ministry or service as the uh, verse states, and says that it is superior to that of the Old Testament. The Lord has enacted a better covenant upon better promises. And so the argument is, if God was so concerned about the inferior institution and every detail of it as he ordained it, how much more would he be concerned about the superior institution? 
Denial of the fact that God has a pattern for the church and that he expects man to follow it is the basis of the denials of the possibility, the necessity, and the actuality of restoration of the church. Liberals believe that God has left structural matters of the church entirely in human hands. The church is wide open as far as they're concerned. In the second place, when individual saints stray from the truth in doctrine or behavior, at least some individuals can be restored to faithfulness. If this premise is true, then there is something to be said about its being true for more than one person who strays to be restored. If this premise is not true, then numerous biblical passages make no sense whatsoever. And one of these is all we need notice. Galatians 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one, in the spirit of meekness or gentleness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. In fact, the backslider and apostate must be restored if he would be saved. That's true of one, why not of two, why not of two hundred, why not of the entire church? The third place, incessant New Testament insistence on doctrinal purity, starting with uh, our Lord and his warning against false teachers, going throughout the epistles as a general theme, argues that those who digress from the faith, whether individuals or congregations, not only can but must be restored if God and his son are to be pleased. And then fourth, and we could have started and ended with this one, the seed principle implies the possibility of restoration, if not its necessity. Seed brings forth only after its kind. Go to Genesis chapter 1 for the application of it from the beginning in all of life. And then come to Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 for its application to spiritual matters. And so in the word of God, which is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8 verse 11, is sown in honest and good hearts. If it brings forth anything, it will bring forth only one thing. You cannot sow the Catholic Catechism and get Baptists. You cannot sow the Baptist Manual and get Mormons. You cannot sow the Book of Mormons and get Christians. And if you sow the Word of God and it germinates, it will bring forth not Baptists or Catholics or Mormons or anything elseians except Christians. After the Jerusalem church began on Pentecost, by what means did churches spring up in other areas of the first century world? How was it recognized by the church in Jerusalem that there was a church in Antioch? Are we to suppose it had nothing in common, such as entrance requirements, worship, organization with the Jerusalem church? And what about those religious bodies called churches throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, as Acts 9 verse 31 refers? And then there are the seven churches of Asia, specifically mentioned and addressed in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And so with so many others on the New Testament map. How could these be recognized and identified without certain marks of identity? And yet over the past several decades, brethren have decided that marks of identity are no-nos. That we ought not to talk about those anymore. Also over the past several decades, brethren have discovered indigenous churches after the New Testament order in various places where none of our people had been sent and none of our people had gone. They had no previous contact with others who believed and practiced as they did. They simply researched the New Testament and formed congregations on the basis of what they found therein. Such cases are proof that there is a pattern for the church and that pattern can be duplicated. That pattern is discernible and the church can be restored in any place and any time people honestly approach the New Testament and reproduce what they find therein. These people allowed the seed to germinate in their hearts. It brought forth after its kind resulting in New Testament churches. 
Both scriptural and logical evidence then abound to convince unbiased hearts that God and his son demand restoration of the church that Jesus built when doctrinal and our practical apostasy overtake it. Since deity has never demanded the impossible of humanity, it is therefore manifest that the restoration of his church is at least possible. But is it a reality? Has the church been restored? That is, in these divine, these outward elements. You know, there is a sense in which the church is a human organization. Nobody but humans can get into it. It wasn't built for dogs and cats. Now, there are some people just uh, uh, lacking enough in intelligence to believe that uh, we ought to preach to dogs and cats. They, they really include in the all creatures of the Great Commission, all creatures. But we know better, don't we? The church was not even built for angels. An angel couldn't get in the church if he wanted to. Now, they're desirous to look into these things. They're curious about them, according to Peter. But the church was not built for them. The church was built for human beings. It is a human institution from that standpoint. But it is a divine institution. If we're talking about what the Lord ordained it would be and how it would operate and how it would look and how it would work and all such things as those. Ours is not the first era to have its restoration deniers and detractors. Benjamin Franklin, not the... Uh, colonial statesman, but a descendant of his, was one of the powerful voices of the 19th century heralding forth the great plea for restoration. When the Missionary Society and instrumental music elements arose that uh, Michael discussed earlier today, about 150 years ago, he boldly opposed and exposed both of them, recognizing that there was no place for them in a restoration of New Testament church. How can you put something in there that was not there to start with and call it restoring something? You have to store it before you can restore it, don't you? And he knew they weren't in the original store. And so there came those denying the restoration, that it was possible. He addressed the aggressives who had given up on the plea and were calling it a failure. And he said, they were merely called brethren. He, he could not really come out and say they are brethren, but they're called brethren. Here's a part of what he said about the restoration. Our reformatory movement, and they referred to it as a reforming movement in those days, was right and is still right. It needs no modification, but needs to be faithfully and honestly carried out. It went back to the divine fountain to find the truth. It went back to the Bible itself. It went back to the religion of Christ itself. This was no failure. The attempt was to go back to the Lord himself, to his own book, to his own religion. And those who attempted this and did it made no failure. They found the Lord, his book, and his religion and found the salvation of the Lord. There was no failure in all this. Well, he was right then about his time, and his words are right for us today. In 1968, after I'd preached a sermon in which I identified faithful churches of Christ with the New Testament church, a young man came by to see me. He was a student at the time at Abilene Christian College, which now is Abilene Christian University. He heard my sermon. He was uh, all but incredulous at my audacity. The very fact that I would identify something at that time with the New Testament church, the church of which we read in the New Testament, oh, it was arrogance and bigotry to do so in his view. He left my study disgusted that anyone would be so narrow-minded and self-righteous as he viewed it as to thus affirm. He voiced, though, what has become, over the past four decades, the view of, I fear, many thousands who claim to be members of the Church of the Lord. 
I was unable to penetrate his emotion-driven contention, and that's all that it was, with either scripture or logic. He left even more upset than he was when he came. My convictions are still the same, brethren. Faithful churches of Christ today are the church of the New Testament as we read of it in God's Word. At the time this young man came to my study, the same Rubel Shelley that I quoted from earlier, radically denouncing the concept of restoration, remember, was staunchly advocating the validity of the restoration plea. In his earlier years, he was as strong as one could be in the faith, not reticent at all about declaring that the restored church exists today. Forty years ago, almost to the very day that I was putting these words on the page last December, the Gospel Advocate ran an article by Rubel Shelley, and the title of the article was exactly the title of this chapter in our book and what I'm speaking on right now. Listen to what he said. I categorically deny the notion that the restoration plea is invalid. I also deny that the goal of restorationism is yet unrealized. The New Testament church, the body and bride of Christ, does exist in the 20th century, and I am a member of that body. Now, as he answered in his statement, yes, the church has been restored, so I answer. I agree with him in every detail of his statement except to update it from the 20th century to the 21st century. Now, what are the bases upon which we can claim a present-day restoration? Well, we've affirmed that the restored church presently exists. How can we say that's so? Well, there are several bases upon which that uh, statement can be made, and we can't look at all of them, but let's look at some of them. The Shelley-type heretics prattle on remorsefully about how in their less sophisticated earlier years they used to preach on the identifying marks of the church. But now they apologize for that, and they promise that they'll never do that again. I submit, however, that it is impossible to conceive of the church as existing at all apart from such identifiers. While the church is indeed a spiritual institution in its nature, that does not preclude the existence of outward visible signs or marks by which to define and distinguish it. Can we distinguish the church as a religious institution apart from a secular institution? If so, there have to be some marks by which to do so. Even if it's not the Lord's church, you can distinguish a religious institution from a totally secular institution by the marks thereof. And yet anti-restoration liberals apparently entertain some such view that holding the church, that the church is some vaporous, indistinguishable, invisible entity without shape or form and most certainly without any borders. A thoroughly denominational approach and outlook. In fact, Shelley and his fellow liberal and co-author Randy Harris argued as much in their 1992 book, The Second Incarnation. According to them, we must ignore Acts and the Epistles if we would learn anything about, the what, uh, what, about what the church is or should be. Where do we look for the church, according to them? Not in Jerusalem as a beginning place, or in any of the epistles to see how the church worshiped or what the apostles wrote to the various churches. No, we go back before Pentecost and we look at the life of Christ and we replicate the life of Christ. We don't look at the Jerusalem church, the Antioch church, the 
Philippian church, any of the other churches to see how they worshiped, or how they were organized, or anything of the kind, how people became members of them. It's just being like Jesus. Jesus is the paradigm, they say, which, as has already been pointed out, is simply a synonym for pattern, which they so despise. Well, as essential as it is for us to try to replicate the life of our Lord, 1 John 2, 6, after all, says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. This fact has no bearing on the nature, structure, or substance of the church. Even to speak of the church, apart from identification properties, is absurd. And to attempt to find the church apart from its outward manifestations would be as foolhardy and impossible as expecting John West to find a stolen automobile without knowing its make or its color or the year it was built or a license number or how many doors it has. There has to be some outward manifestations, some marks of identity. Given the liberal view of the church, how might one ever know if he had or had not found it or whether he was in or not in it? And that probably is exactly what they want. This is, in fact, their aim by which they can embrace the denominations in their fellowship. These things are irrelevant. They're beside the point. They make no difference. And so they legislate them out of existence. In the last six or seven years, the seed of such loose fellowship has taken root in many who are not among those rank anti-restoration liberals. It continues to bear bitter and bad fruit. Consider the following bases now for the claim of present day restoration. The Old Testament prophets foresaw the establishment of the church. Under such, uh, under such uh, terms as the kingdom being prophesied or the mountain of the Lord's house in Isaiah chapter 2. Now these men did not prophesy an imperceptible entity that would be unrecognizable when it arrived. Although we know that when it did arrive or as the time of its arrival was at hand, they were expecting a totally physical and political kingdom that does not mean that when it did arrive it had no means of identity surely it did second place Jesus preached the kingdom is at hand Matthew 4 17 he told the apostles they would live to see the coming of the kingdom Mark 9 and verse 1 there was going to be something visible, some sort of identifiable property or properties by which they could see when the kingdom came. In the third place, when Jesus promised to build his church, as he did in Matthew 16, 18, the apostles could hardly have thought he was referring merely to individuals who would follow his character traits, and that would be the church. Some, especially the apostles, were already doing that. If this were all that it takes to constitute the church, then the church came into being well before Pentecost. And since clearly the church did not come into being before Pentecost, that could not have been what the Lord was talking about, could it? The fourth place, Jesus promised the apostles he would send the Holy Spirit to them who would guide them into all the truth, John 16, 13. Upon receiving the truth, they were to take it into all the world, Mark 16, 15, beginning in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. That occurred, of course, on Pentecost, the record of which we have in Acts chapter 2. Before Pentecost, the church is always in anticipation of coming, whether it's under the figure of a kingdom, the mountain of the Lord's house, or the other terms that are used concerning it before Acts 2. From Acts 2, 47 on, men are said for the first time to be added to it, and from there on throughout the New Testament, men and women continue to be added to it as they obey the gospel of Christ. The Lord did not add the 3,000 to the church because they were emulating the character traits of the Lord. 
but because they heard the gospel, believed in Christ, confessed their faith, both of those are implicit in the words of Acts 2, verse 37, by the way, and upon being told to do so, repented of their sins, were baptized into Christ for forgiveness of their sins. That's why and when they were added to the church. That's still the case. The sixth place, from its beginning, the apostles' teaching included the church. The apostles taught the Jerusalem church about fellowship, about the breaking of bread, about prayers. These are outward manifestations of what the church would be, Acts 2, verse 42. And then the message the apostles preached was and is a distinctive and integrated whole. Thus the aggregate, the inspired writers frequently called the faith, was the message that was preached everywhere. I teach the same thing everywhere in every church, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 17. Acts 6 and verse 7, men could be obedient to the faith as a great company the priests were, and so on. It produced and produces, that faith does, the faith, a distinctive result, which is the church. Then the eighth place, the gospel was and is a singular message for all men. Mark 16, 15, it's not a gospel for the Gentiles, another one for the Jews, this one is for all men. Consequently, all of the apostles taught the same thing everywhere they went. They preached the same message in the Jewish synagogues when they first went in in trying to establish the church. When they were chased out of those, then the church was established and they preached the same message in every one of those churches that they established. The churches were composed of men and women who had responded to the same gospel commands. Members of each congregation were therefore all to speak the same thing, be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment, have no divisions among them on these things the apostles taught them. 1 Corinthians 1.10. All of the churches assembled on the same day, first day of the week, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. First day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, and so forth. Now this means all of the churches were one. From all of the above, it follows that the record of what the apostles did as churches demonstrates exactly what the apostles obligated them to do. Also follows that the decrees of the apostles set forth these arrangements and obligations for the church in perpetuity. The Lord's will was not to be altered in the least. To the end of the world, they would have preached that same gospel. To teach them to observe all things whatsoever they were commanded to the end of the world. Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. These practices then verily constitute identifying marks of the church. Beginning from Acts 2 verse 41 and continuing through Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. The last letter addressed to a church of the New Testament. Now if you're following in your book you'll see that we have listed a number of those characteristics. Outward manifestations of the church as the Lord designed it because these are the things the apostles taught as they established the churches. They're all external visible marks of identity, all of the denials of liberals notwithstanding. When people in this day or any other day obey the terms of pardon first issued on Pentecost, and events the foregoing characteristics, which we didn't have time to name here, they most certainly constitute the church even as in the first century. It's neither self-righteous, brethren, nor self-serving, but simply factual to say that faithful churches of Christ here and now constitute the restored church. Does this mean that every building that has Church of Christ on it houses a restored church No, not at all. Not any more than slapping a Cadillac emblem on a Ford makes every Ford a Cadillac. This long ago passed away. Many of us remember when it was almost universal. You see Church of Christ on a building, you know what they're going to be doing in worship. You know what they are teaching. You know how they're going to be organized. You know how people became members of it. That day has long since passed. But it's not because it's impossible 
for it to be that way. It should be the way some of us can still remember it was. I have told audiences in countless sermons over the years that the New Testament church exists today, that I am a member of it, and they also can be before they leave that building that day or night if they choose, and I say so still. One will not read very long or very much of what the anti-restoration folk write before they discover the foundation of their denials. As liberals, they chafe at restriction or confinement of what they believe and our practice. After all, a basic meaning of the term liberal is free from restraint. They do not want anyone, including God and his son, holding them back, telling them what they may or may not do or say or practice. And when one gets down to it, liberalism is merely thinly disguised universalism. We might call it universalism light. They're not willing to step out there like the universalist church does and the Unitarian church does and just be proud of the fact that they are uh, heretics. They just sort of like to believe that everybody's going to somehow make it into heaven anyhow, regardless of what the Lord has said about it. And so they release and remove the restraints one by one. They cannot visualize the Lord saying, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. In spite of the fact that he said clearly, clearly he will do that. That which the current day liberals in the church and all professed believers on the outside, I assume, deny, I am pleased to affirm then. I have not the slightest hesitation to say that the church can be restored, has been restored wherever men and women are faithfully following the New Testament and must be restored if our world has a chance to hear the gospel. Have you ever thought, brethren, that if we fail either through apostasy or through apathy to preach the gospel to the world that there's nobody else left to do it? The Catholics are not going to do it. None of the denominations are going to do it. Big business is not going to do it. The government's trying to restrain us from doing it. Who's going to do it if we don't do it? We've got to, number one, be faithful, and number two, we've got to keep on preaching. Maybe someone is in the sound of my voice tonight, either in this building, or listening from some remote spot by the internet, or maybe at some distant day, we'll pull up the remarks I've made tonight, listen to them, and watch them. And you've never heard what the New Testament teaches about salvation and forgiveness of sin. It's been preached uh, many times during this week of lectures, and we've alluded to it somewhat in passing tonight, but let me reiterate it as we close. You need go no further than the birthday of the church to see what the plan of salvation for all time actually is. People heard the gospel preached on that day, and it convicted them of their sins and brought faith to their hearts because faith comes by hearing the word of God Romans 10:17 they were so convicted of their sins as they believed on the Christ that had been preached to them that they cried out interrupting the sermon and said men and brethren what shall we do you have their confessed belief implied by that question now, if Billy Graham had been there, he would have said, well, you need to do nothing. You're already saved. Just go home and join the church of your choice. If Max Licato had been there, he would have said the same thing. But poor old Peter, he was just an inspired apostle. He didn't know any better. And so he said, repent ye and be baptized, meaning immersed in water. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ by his authority 
unto, in order to receive the remission, forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now there is scriptural precedent for long sermons. For with many other words did he testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And then verse 41 tells us, They that gladly received his word were baptized, implying that they had believed in Christ and confessed their faith in Christ and repented of their sins. And upon being baptized, they were added unto the church that day, about 3,000 souls. If you'll read down to verse 47, you'll see that. You need do nothing else to be in the church of Christ. In fact, if you do other things or fall short of doing those things, you cannot be in the church of Christ, not the church of the New Testament. And that's where you want to be because that's what the Lord's going to save someday. Maybe you've done that and you've not been faithful. My brother and sister, you're just as lost as if you had never obeyed the gospel of Christ until you are restored. Would you come back to him today? Does anyone need to respond to the gospel invitation? Come while we stand and sing.